Walt Disney. Greta, the misfit greyhound. are the fastest dogs in the world, and racing them has always appealed to man's sporting blood. From its informal beginnings back in ancient times, it has grown into a big business. Luxurious racing parks cater to the spectator's pleasure, and state-appointed officials are always on the job at each racetrack to make sure that before each race, every dog entered is in the best possible shape to compete with dogs of equal ability. A greyhound is not so much an animal as a number he hopes to make money on. And as each greyhound is okayed for the race and paraded out from paddock to track with suitable ceremony, the personalities of the individual dogs fade away and each one becomes a potential speed machine, identifiable from the others only by its number. is a marvel of mechanical efficiency. The doors of the starting boxes are electrically operated. They open with split-second precision, releasing the dogs, who sprint down the track in pursuit of a mechanical rabbit, which in turn is controlled so that it's always about 50 feet ahead of the fastest dogs. run after that electric bunny with high enthusiasm because their instinct compels them to chase anything that moves. That's what makes greyhound racing. Our story is about one particular racing greyhound named Greta. And a good place to begin would be the day a beat up old truck rolled onto the grounds of an Arizona track, driven by one of the less elegant members of the racing fraternity. He was the kind that ekes out a meager living racing just one or two dogs. This fella had all his hopes pinned on one, Greta. Now, this was too bad, because out of all the dogs he could have chosen, Greta was a misfit. She was the one greyhound in a million who didn't like all the fanfare of racing. As the dogs are checked in, track rules insist that they be muzzled. Otherwise, their eagerness to run builds such tensions that their usually good dispositions can easily give way to everything from nervous bickering to out-and-out -out free for alls could have saved the wear and tear on Greta's muzzle. There were no tensions building in her today. Even if the others were raring to go, this race meant as little to her as it meant everything to her owner. In fact, he didn't know what he'd do tomorrow if Greta wasn't in the money today. Annie's attitude was the essence of everything Greta wanted to get away from. It was always the race that mattered. It seemed to her that although she was treated with care, there was never affection. Now here was a man she could have liked, 
but when he laid a hand on her, it was only to be sure her toenail identification matched the one on her chart. If somebody, just once, would even act a little playful or do something a little different. Experience and a strong time sense told Greta that she and the other dogs were about to be paraded down to the track for the same old sixes and sevens. could hardly wait. They all loved the life of the racetrack. Some of them got so excited that the lure always had to be covered up while the dogs were taken to the starting boxes. It was when she was put in her starting box that Greta, knew she couldn't go around that track again without doing something different. This time, she was gonna have some fun. like a mindless automatic number, sprinting around the track and never getting close to the quarry. She was gonna get out of that pack of numbers and think for herself for once. Now she could cut through the infield, she could head those rabbits off at the home stretch. First, there was a feeling of pride in what she had done. She quickly sensed the unspoken surprise and disapproval around her. And then the cold, wordless anger of her owner lay like a weight on her back. Greta's moment of rebellion was more successful than she knew, for it barred her from ever racing again. To a fringe operator, there's nothing as useless as a greyhound who's been barred from racing. A twinge of conscience might have nagged Greta's owner, but not for long. He was tossing her out of his life, just like he'd throw a beer can to the side of the road. For most of her life, this makeshift kennel had been her only home. Now, for a reason she couldn't understand, it was going out of her life. Fortunately for Greta, her first bewilderment at being abandoned in a strange big world was cut short by the sight of an old familiar object. She 
had always suspected that some important element was missing on the racetrack. Now she knew. This was fun, real excitement. Now the rabbit was keeping her hopping, and Greta couldn't plan the shortcuts. After the excitement came the letdown. She'd expected to catch that rabbit. about one fella who seemed to enjoy life in a basement apartment got the best of her to the point where she was downright snoopy. It was getting to be the time of day when Greta was used to being fed. Her stomach was reminding her to the extent that she was willing to try for the title of the first fishing greyhound. But it's always the same no matter where you go. As soon as you start to fish, there's somebody I. If it isn't the game warden, it's the fella that owns the fishing rights. But Greta's strongest instinct had yet to be tempered by common sense. She still went by the philosophy that if it ran, you chased it. Even if it meant leaving the day's catch unguarded.
It wasn't until she saw her dinner disappearing up the tree that she realized she'd have to make a few changes in her way of life. She was a lonely greyhound in search of a friend. And then she saw a small town just over the bend. Maybe here was someone who'd understand. Someone with a friendly hand. Every animal domesticated by man seems to know that only man is responsible for buildings. But the men responsible for these buildings had left the scene many years ago, and only a ghost of a wind remained to whisper of gold and gaiety long gone. The next morning, her visit to the ghost town had faded into a memory of a bad dream. Her efforts to feed herself had produced nothing but food for thought. And as she was about to give up, along came one of the vast horde of national insects called litter bugs. But all it offered was a banana peel, an eggshell, and an old crust of bread. The crust of bread hadn't been much of a meal, so Greta had to fill up on optimism. More than likely, the people in this house were just sitting in there waiting to welcome a nice, hungry dog. Nothing for her to do but keep moving. Her feet, already tender from the miles behind her, protested at every step over the cruel dark rocks that seemed to have no ending. Her painful progress had only one thing in its favor. It took her mind off of the ever increasing hunger.
Greta had reached sheep country, what she saw was the combined flocks of several Basque sheep herders. She had no idea what this was all about or what the animals were that dotted the landscape in such abundance. But among them moved men and dogs. first joy in finding a creature like herself was soon doused. This fellow was like all the others in this forbidding world. He had no time for anything but his own business. But the sense of survival was stronger now than any delicacy of manners, and she followed him boldly into camp. They'd probably try to run her off, but she knew she wasn't able to travel one step farther. Chip, ready for the supper? Ave Maria, where'd you get your friend? It's a dog or sack of bones. Excuse me, dog, come on, come to me. Come to Domingo. You poor smart dog, come and just arrive for the supper. Looks like you need a few suppers anyway. Hello, my skinny little friend. Yalo lila. Now we're gonna put you sheepskin shoes and you're gonna be walking like it new again two three days so maybe number six maybe number three i don't know what size you use but uh, we're gonna try greta didn't mind a few rude stairs the soft boots shielded her sore paws so she could walk with comfort But more than that, even the laughter was friendly in this place. And she sensed that the boots made by Domingo, the herder, were expressions of his warm-hearted concern. In the first days, nothing in this woolly new place made sense. Greta didn't understand Chip's sudden dash to a small bunch that had drifted away from the others or his never-ending vigil over these uninteresting creatures. Her sharp eyes were looking for something to run after. How near that something was, only Chip realized. In sheep country, the coyotes always know when a small flock drifts off from the others and when one lone dog has got his hands full, then they can play their old coyote game with everything stacked in their favor. This game started as soon as one of them had hidden himself in the brush and the other gave the signal to go. They knew a coyote howl coming from close by always played on a sheepdog's protective instinct and brought him running to chase the menace away. Now, Chip didn't know it, but he'd been chosen to be it. Coyote number one used all kinds of delaying tactics guaranteed to fool the dog, so that Chip, unsuspecting, was away from the very flock he was trying to protect. When 
coyote number two moved in according to plan. But one thing they'd overlooked entirely was the newcomer. Her Farsi and greyhound eyes spotted the activity out in the flock. The sudden appearance of a new player on the other side panicked half the leading team. Nothing like this had ever happened before in all the long history of the Sagebrush League, where the Coyotes up to now had always written the rules. number one was getting tired of this holding action. He looked around for his teammate and then saw Greta. About the same time she saw him. He tried to cancel the game, claiming a foul. But now it was Greta who was calling the shots. And although the coyote was a great broken field runner, he was no match for a greyhound. As soon as Greta got Chip off the hook, his instinct took him back where he belonged. And Greta reveled in the pure pleasure of knowing she could scatter coyotes better than anybody. And when Chip, that dour old herdsman who had never so much as given her a nod before, welcomed her back from her victories as a partner, it had quite a dizzy effect on both of them and was undoubtedly responsible for Greta showing off her own special talent for speed just once more. The news of Greta's coyote stampede swept the other camps like wildfire. It was the best excuse for a party these Basque sheep men had had all year. Of course, the first slice of the fresh, warm sheep herder's bread went to the guest of honor. She was the best coyote dog from Maine to Spain.
Then it was time for the big herds to move on to the higher pasture country. Trek also marked the beginning of an unspoken agreement between Chip and Greta. He would drive and tend the sheep as usual, but now he didn't have to worry about the varmints. Greta was riding shotgun. With all the wisdom of his Basque ancestry, Domingo recognized Greta's deep need for making a useful place for herself in these unlikely surroundings. So, he saw to it that she became a sort of a four-legged Florence Nightingale to the flock. By the time Domingo was ready to establish a new camp, he gave Greta the added responsibility of helping bring in their supplies. Now we got the food. So we're gonna watch this sheep. Lots of animals are here. No letting this animal steal our good food. So I'm gonna get another load and you're gonna stay here, watch it. It's always a great feeling to be able to go off knowing you've left your affairs in capable hands. And Greta was ready to show all potential trespassers who was boss. But nobody had told her that prowlers in that country came in shapes and sizes she'd never dreamed of. Something about the unexpected visitor made her nervous. And her misgivings weren't helped any by the appearance of two pocket-sized models of the original. Until she could find some way to get rid of these crashers, all she could do was bark. The plain truth was, there was nothing Greta had that was any earthly use in this new situation. Yesterday's heroine was becoming today's has-been. It looked like Greta was a misfit all over again. were out and out hoodlums, but it wasn't surprising when you figured the example their mall was setting. Yeah. <laughs> 
was anybody's guess where all this was going to end. Big spree had been bad enough up to now, but when Greta was a helpless witness to the dying gasp of Domingo's most prized possession, this was just too piercing. What's the matter, you? What kind of a dog you are? I trust you. I tell you, watch this camp. And I find everything gone. Domingo's report of bear trouble brought the conservation officers within the hour, all in their specially designed bear trap. Hey, it looks like you really had some trouble here, haven't he you? He told his morning. He told the group. Tear it up this morning? Yeah. Man, that's too bad. In spite of Domingo's Basque-flavored runaway English, the men learned that the camp wreckers had moved on to the upper meadow. As they outlined how they'd placed the trap to best advantage up there, Greta looked skeptical. There was plenty of room for the bears in this thing, but exactly how were you going to get them in there? How many bear came into camp? Three. Three. Two little ones and the mother. Two cubs and the old mother. Yeah. If we could catch those two cubs and get them in here, first, the old mother will come in on her own. Come on, Phil. Let's go and get them. good break came when Chip discovered the mother bear heading upstream and persuaded her to change her mind. The cubs were tagging along not far behind her. In fact, they were just about where Greta thought they'd be. Time element was getting tricky. 
Domingo had to spirit those cubs away from Mama's apron strings and into the trap first before she realized what was up. So he plunged wholeheartedly into his work. By the time the officers found a likely spot, Domingo had routed the cubs up into the clearing. success Domingo and Greta were having, they might as well have been playing blind man's buff. The whole thing might have fallen apart right then and there if the cubs, in their innocence, hadn't shinnied up a stump. taught Greta to pull a harness as a trick, or at most a pleasant pastime. They both knew now that it just might save the day. The conservation boys had picked out what they hoped would be the best spot for the wind-up of the action. And being bare psychologists, they knew Domingo must be having a time handling those two rough and tumble delinquents. The trap door made a pretty small target to aim for when your ammunition was unpredictable. At least Greta had faith. She considered Domingo the smartest man in the world. And Chip the smartest dog. But even Chip couldn't keep Big Mama at bay when she kept hearing her youngins squalling. job to do her misfit days are through Greta Greta no longer the misfit greyhound Greta Greta 